Today, uh, I'm going to do a two-part, probably it may go beyond two parts, but a two-part message that I've titled, The Power of Words. The Power of Words. One of the most important disciplines we must develop is the ability to use our words in ways that benefit us. Words are very powerful. Words move the world. Words affect every area of our lives. They transmit our feelings. Words create our environment. As a matter of fact, the history of humanity is a story of the power of words. Great leaders, great thinkers on every sphere, whether they are military generals, political leaders, or people who stand in the pulpit, have used the power of words to transform individuals, to move emotions, to direct people in a particular area, to shape the course of destiny. Words create actions. And from our actions, we manifest the things that are around us. Everywhere you turn, you see the power of words in manifestation. And our world itself and the universe was created by words and is sustained by the power of the word. Words are critical to your survival on this planet, to your victory in life. If you're going to be successful, you have to learn how to use words intentionally and very powerfully. Many times our words are very weak and our words can become tools of self-defeat instead of tools of victory. And today we're going to learn how God uses words. We're going to learn how we must use words. And then we're going to look at the power of words. And we're going to end by looking at how we must use words when we are in a battle. When life is tough, how to use words. So let's start by looking at how God uses words. Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. It seems as if almost everything I teach starts from Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 to 5, and we read these words. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light and God saw the light that it was good and God divided the light from darkness God called the light day and the darkness he called night so the evening and the morning were the first day in this two in this passage we see two verbal actions from God. Two ways that God uses words. Uh, and we're going to look at these two verbal actions and then we're going to look at how God expects us also to use words. The first verbal action that we see from God is from the phrase, then God said. Then God said. That word said in the original language means to think to mention and to command. The words God spoke were not generated on the spur of the moment. In other words, God didn't just get up one moment and just decide to speak. They were words that have been in him for eternity. They were expressions of his intentional thoughts and he mentioned those thoughts as commands. Then God Said. That's the first way God uses words. When God says something in this context, he said, let there be, that word is creative. It is a creative word. When we say it's a creative word, it means that he brings things into existence by his word. He brings things into existence by his word. The first verbal action of God is to create by saying, create by making a command, create by mentioning something. 
The second verbal action of God in, that we find in the passage is that God called. He didn't just say, but he called. The word called means to proclaim, to name, and to appoint. He called the darkness light, and he called the day, he called the darkness night, and the light he called day. This is what we call descriptive use of words. There is a creative and there is the descriptive. He created with words and then he described what he had created. He identified and named what he had created. That tells us that when God speaks, he doesn't just, just speak because he has to speak. He speaks with a clear purpose to create things and to properly describe things. To create and to describe. Words must be creative and words must be properly descriptive. This is very important because we're going to see this expand as God uh, interacts with man, and we're going to see how we also must use words. So now, we've seen how God uses words. He says, and he calls. He creates, and he describes. Now, how does God want us to use words? How, do we, how are we supposed to use words? Well, in the same Genesis chapter 2, the first action that God gives to man or assignment, Genesis chapter 2 verse 19 and 20. Genesis 2, 19 and 20, we read, Out of the ground... Out of the ground, the Lord formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle and to the birds of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. Very interesting. There are two things we want to look at. We look at what God does, and then we look at what man does. First thing, let's look at what God does. God, the Bible says, he brought the animals he has created before Adam. So God brings things our way. God is going to bring things your way. The animals were not created by Adam. They were created by God. He created them and brought them the way of Adam. So Adam literally is sitting his somewhere, as we say in Ghana, when God started parading animals before him. Now it's very important to note that when you read Genesis chapter 1, and we read just a few verses of chapter 1, but if you read the whole of Genesis chapter 1, God creates a names. He creates a name. So he creates, uh, he says, let there be light. He names the night, and then he names the day. Let there be firmament, and then he names it. Whatever he creates, he names. But when it comes to this, he doesn't name. He creates and leaves the naming to Adam. So what God does is that he brings things our way. He brings things our way. Now, many times in life, you're going to have things come in your way that you didn't create. You didn't cause it to be, but it comes your way. And when it comes your way, God is going to see how you respond to it. Now, why did God bring the animals go Adam's way? Because the Bible says he wants to see what Adam will call them. He wants to see what Adam will call them. That was the reason God brought the animals Adam's way because he wants to check Adam out. 
How are you going to call these things I'm bringing your way? What, are, what names are you going to give them? How are you going to describe them? Because I've given you the power of words, you're going to use it now to describe what I'm bringing your way. So the first thing, God brings the, the thing, animals, God's, Adam's way. He brings things our way. And the reason he does that, he wants to see what you're going to name them. So now, let's see what Adam does. The Bible says that Adam found names for every animal. So we must name the things that God brings our way. We must name the things that God brings our way. Now that's very interesting. Adam found names for every animal. You may, these days it's very easy to say, oh, well, I could have done it. But remember, he had to find a word for everything that God brought his way. He had to find a word for it. He couldn't just call them this thing or something. He had to give them a descriptive and a proper name. One of the things I've noticed uh, in dealing with many of us and many people is that we don't have words for many things. Uh, in fact, in our local vernacular, we have uh, 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 no name as a name. And so when, when I was growing up, there were some things that we called don't name. Amudin, don't name it, don't call it. So in, in a lot of our uh, 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 native language, uh, there are so many things we don't name because they are things that must not be named. However, God says one of the reasons why he gave you the power of words is that you must name everything. You must name everything. You must have a name for everything because if you can't name it, you can't own it. You can't control it. So what Adam is supposed to do, he's supposed to name the things that God brings his way. That would be a very tough job for Adam because he has to make sure he doesn't repeat names. He can't just call you dog, 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 or cat, 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 monkey, 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 uh, and everything is a monkey. Everything is a dog. Everything is a cow. Everything is a hippopotamus. No. He had to make sure a hippopotamus has his name. And the name is not the same as an elephant's name. And it's not the same as a cow's name. And it's not the same as a monkey's name. And even the monkeys, to have different names for them. Have you noticed that in most of our local languages, names are very general? When we say monkey is monkey. No, all the species are all monkey. Uh, when we say orange is orange and we don't differentiate between the species because there is a deficiency in description. Adam is supposed to name the things that God brings his way and the Bible says that whatever he called them, that is what they were. Whatever he called them, that is what they were. The name Adam gave each animal was its name. Whatever he called them, that was its name. And that's a very awesome responsibility. Whatever. So if Adam saw an animal and called it my tormentor, it's going to be a tormentor to him. My killer is going to be a killer to him. My helper, it will be a helper to him. My enemy, it will be an enemy to him. Whatever he called them, that is what they were. God says it's your choice. So if you see a lion and you call it my killer, you are in big trouble. You see a snake and you call it my biter, <laughs> you will be bitten. If you see uh, a crocodile and call it my eater, so shall it be. Whatever you call it, so shall it be. So shall it be. That's a very awesome power. Whatever you call, so shall it be. So, the question is, when you go through life and God brings something before you, whatever you call it, that's the name it's going to be. So, if you call it, this is my end, it will be your end. This is my beginning, it will be your beginning. 
This is going to destroy me. It will destroy you. This is going to promote me. It's going to promote me because whatever you call it, so shall it be. You cannot control the things that come your way. But you control how you call them. You can't control the things that come your way because life is going to present you with so many things. You're going to go through life and so many things will pass in front of you. Things you don't control, things you didn't create. Because, you know, one thing you, you're going to lie, uh, learn about life is that trouble has a way of finding you. Have you noticed that? You are sitting here somewhere, you are not calling for trouble, you are not praying for trouble, you are praying trouble will not come and then trouble shows up. You wish it won't happen and then it happens. You wish something will not manifest and then it manifests. How are you going to deal with it when you didn't create it but it comes before you? God says, whatever you call it, so shall it be. In other words, one of the things we have to master in life is how to describe and call the things that come our way. If you call it my end, it will be your end. If you call it my beginning, it will be your beginning. If you go and take an exam, and uh, depending on which exam you take, if you get a nine, which is supposed to be failure, and you call it my end. That will be your end. But if you also call it my beginning, God will open a new door for you. Whatever you call it, so shall it be. Because sometimes, you know, you, you, you talk to parents, and there are parents who are very excited about their children. Oh, my child was best in class got first prize, beat all the children. Now, while they are saying their children beat all the children, somebody cannot say my children beat all the children because their children were the beating. <laughs> so what do you say when your child comes home and he's the beating and not the one who beat? And he collected the remnant. What was left that nobody liked, all the nice and all the failures, you collected it. You look at him, what will you call him? Because whatever you call him, so shall he be. Whatever you call him, so shall he be. If you're going to look at that child and say, you are a failure, your head is dead, as you say in Ghana, your head is dead. The head is still sitting on top of his head, but we say the head, your head is dead. So shall it be. If you look at him and you say, you will not amount to anything, so shall it be. If you say that, oh, I'm so di disappointed in you, so will you be disappointed. If you call your child disappointment, you will be disappointed. But if you call him hope and destiny and favor and increase, you can say, well, you start with nine, but your end will be one. Whatever you call it, God is not going to force you to name things. He's going to bring things your way. You have the power to call it. It's the power of words. Whatever Adam call it, that was its name. Whatever you call it, that is its name. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 20 to 21. Very popular verse. Proverbs 18, 20 to 21. I like, I like it. It says, a man's stomach, I suppose women can join in. A man's stomach shall be filled from the fruit of his mouth. From the produce of his lips, he shall be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. 
death and life are in the power of the tongue. Now, what does the passage tell us? It tells us that our words have power to either attract life or death to us. Words are not passive. Words are active. What we say has power. What we say can bring us life or can bring us death. You can speak life or death to the things that God brings your way. Our words can give life to things or destroy them. There are situations in our lives that must not be given life and there are also situations that must not be allowed to die. So, you don't give life to the negatives of your life and you don't give death to the positives of your life. You don't look at something that is negative in your life and keep validating it. Keep enforcing it. Keep power empowering it. Oh, as for this, this thing, it will not work. This, my marriage is horrible. This thing will not work. This marriage is ending in divorce. This man is horrible. This woman is horrible. I don't even know why I, 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 I married this person. What you're doing is that you have a negative life or situation and you are giving life to it. And so far as you make that, the words of your mouth, so shall it be. So shall it be. But you can also have a situation in your life that is positive that you kill it with your mouth. Because sometimes good things can happen to us but we are so negative that everything we say about that good thing is negative. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. The second lesson we learn from that verse is that we reap the harvest of the kinds of words we love using. We reap the harvest of the kinds of words we love using. Have you taken time to monitor the words you love using? I think it would be good sometimes to take a notebook and a pencil or pen or if you are tech savvy maybe you use notes in your, on your phone and go through the day and capture the words you use and you're going to find that sometimes there are some words you love using they, they, they become part of you there are people who are always saying things like I'm sick. I'm sick is a love they, a word they love using. I'm sick. I'm tired. I'm afraid. I'm afraid it won't work. I'm afraid it won't work. I'm afraid it won't work. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. And you find that you love talking about fear or tiredness or weakness or failure or disappointment. Oh, I'm hurt. And the Bible says if you love using those words, you're going to eat the fruit of them. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And he who loves them shall eat the fruit of them. So take a look at the words you, you like using. I can't do it. I'm dying. I'm suffering. Life is hard. Do you know that there are some people that no matter the assignment you give them, their pre-worked answer is, I can't. They, they don't even let you finish the sentence. I can't. Can you walk? I can't. Can you sit? I can't. Can you sing? I can't. Can you jump? I can't. 
What can you? I can't. Now, if you're a person who is always saying, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, the Bible says you're going to eat the fruit of I can't. Oh, I'm tired. Oh, I'm sick. I'm weak. Life is hard. Things are hard. Things are difficult. And then there are also people who say, I can. I will. I will overcome. I will win. It will be well. It's going to change. Things will be better. I will smile. I will rejoice. I will be, fi- I will, I will be successful. I will overcome. The Bible says if that's your language, you eat the fruit of it. So you check yourself. What is your most frequently used phrase? Now, if you can't check it for yourself, then get somebody who's close to you to monitor your language. Maybe tell your best friend, what are the words that I, I like using? And you'd be surprised what they may tell you. What are the words that I love using? Do I, do I sound positive or negative? Ask your friend, ask your husband, ask your wife. How, how do I use words? Because death and life are in the power of the tongue that he who loves it shall eat the fruit of it. If you love using a particular word, that word will manifest in your life. We reap the harvest of the kinds of words we love using. Romans chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. When I was talking about walking by faith and not by sight, I spoke about Abraham and his faith. And we'll look at a few thoughts about Abraham and his faith. And then we're going to conclude on how to use words when we get into battle. Romans chapter 4, verse 16 to 17. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls the things which do not exist as though they did. Now, God's word to Abraham was very clear. This is what God said to Abraham. I have made you a father of many nations. That's where everything starts. What God has made you. I have made you a father of many nations. The power of our words must be rooted in the power of God's word. I have made you a father of many nations. Ask yourself, what has God made me? What has he made you? Because what he's made you is going to form the basis of what you say. Now when God says to Abraham, I've made you a father of many nations. Then God changed the name of Abraham from Abram, exalted father, to Abraham father of many nations. Why? Because I've made you a father of many nations. But I don't have a child. I've made you a father of many nations. But I, don't, I can't even see ten children. I've made you a father of many nations. I have made you. There are some things that God has finished about you. He's not going to start doing it. He's made you. You say, well, but I don't see it. But he's made you. And what he has made you, it may be very different from what you are experiencing. I've made you a father of many nations. Now, Abraham believed God. Now, the basis on which he believed God was based on what he knew about God. And the Bible says he knew that God is able to give life to the death. There's nothing too hard for him. 
With God, there is always hope. He is able to give life to the dead. And then he knew something else about God. That God calls the things we do not exist as if they exist. That means that what God says about you will always contradict your current experience. What God has said made you will always contradict who you are. So for that child who is carrying the class, and please be very sympathetic that any time your child does well, remember somebody's child was last. Because those people who are last, they also have parents. Once in a while, he to be your child. And it's very frustrating when you're a parent and your child is always last in class. And you wonder, why can't they learn? Why can't they learn? Why? Why? Your mates can learn. What's wrong with you? Why? What's in your head? Very frustrating. But God can look at that child who is last and say, you are a leader of nations. And he said, God, a leader of what? Nation. This one. I have made you a leader of nations. But he's failing all his exams. You know, some of the people who have really impacted our world were last in class. I don't want to mention their name. You can go read about them. People whom the world admire and, and they are big celebrities and some couldn't read. They just couldn't read. Most of them were dyslexic. You know, when in, in, in Ghana, we don't understand when somebody has dyslexia, we say, the head is dead. Because I remember when I was in primary school, up to middle form two, I had people in my class who couldn't say A, B, C, D to Z. My class. Middle school form two. This will be now JHS two. Can't say A, B, C to Z correctly. I, J, K, M, M, O, P. <laughs> M, O, M, O, P. <laughs> you see, M, M, O, P at form two. Now, if that is your child, you will look at the child and say, I've wasted my life. Now, in those days, we laughed at them. I mean, I had people in class that couldn't read. I mean, books that we read, they can read. And the word is right in front of them. We say, can't you see the word? And he reads it opposite. Now we know that it's a disease. It's a sickness. But we didn't know them. We laughed at them, made fun of them. But that's your child. That, that would be painful. Can't you read? But I've seen people who couldn't read and still can't read. Who have more money than you get in three lifetimes. Because when God makes you, I have made you, he calls the things which be not as though they were. So when God looks at you, he doesn't look at what you have now, where you have now, what you've achieved now. He just talks about what he has made you. Now what he has made you may be very, very opposite what you are experiencing. And when you call yourself what God has made you, everybody will laugh at you. You can't even read. You're saying M-M-O-P in, <laughs> from two. And you think you'll be president one day. I bet you there are a lot of presidents who said M-M-O-P. Who couldn't say the alphabet. Presidents who couldn't string alphabets together. Who led nations and led them very successfully. There are people who have become mega stars in the world, world changers, who cannot multiply, who cannot add numbers, who cannot read sentences, who still need somebody to read for them. They have enough money to employ somebody to read for them. 
But if you look at them, you have said, you could have said, this will amount to nothing. If you saw Abraham, you say, this guy is nuts. You are 90 years old, 95. You don't have a child. The child you used to have, you have sent him into the bush with the mother, into exile. You are zero, and you are calling yourself father of many nations. But Abraham believed God. So when God says, I've changed your name, you're now Abraham, he said, yes, sir, I'm Abraham. I've changed your wife's name, she's now Sarah. Yes, sir, she's Sarah. Doesn't look like a Sarah, but she is Sarah. Don't look like an Abraham, but I am Abraham. I'm going to say what you say about me. My words will align with your words. Because I'm going to say what you have made me and not what I'm experiencing. Not what I'm going through. God calls the things which be not as though they were. And you have to learn to replicate him. God has a way of calling you the opposite of how you see yourself. When you are a coward, he calls you mighty. When you are one, he calls you a thousand. When you are poor, he calls you rich. When you are cast away, he calls you accepted. When you are a sinner, he calls you saved. When you are empty, he calls you full. Because many times what he has made you is very different from what you're experiencing. I came to tell somebody here this morning, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what life is bringing in front of you. I don't know what you're experiencing. I don't know the things buffeting you, but you can name them differently. You can name them differently. You can call them by a different name, and you can call yourself by a different name. And whatever you call it, so shall it be that will become its name. I like to call myself handsome. What do you think? That's a nice name. (laughs) Handsome. When I was a child, my mother told me that I was so ugly at birth. Yeah, yeah, she told me. She told me I I wasn't good looking. My nose was flat. My mouth was extra large. There's a way in which childhood amplifies features. I've seen very ugly people win beauty contests. Don't be disappointed in your child. He will look handsome. You look at your daughter and say, hey, which man will marry this thing? (laughs) Somebody will. Somebody will. You marry somebody's daughter. Somebody will. (laughs) So so my my mother told me, you know, she used to sell and she said I I would be at her back and she would be going out to sell. And people will ask her, uh, you know, uh, who is that baby at your back? <laughs> so that's not my child. That's not my son. <laughs> I think she was saying it as a joke, but just to amplify the fact that I wasn't good looking. But look at me now. Look at me now. What do you think? At least that lady there thinks I'm good looking. So how do you call yourself? You can call yourself handsome. You can call yourself beautiful. You can call yourself on top. You can call yourself amazing. You can call yourself rising. You can call yourself billionaire. These days, millionaires, we've passed there long ago. Billionaire. You can call yourself rich. You can call yourself highly favored. Whatever you call it, so shall it be. So shall it be. You may not look it, but you are it. You may not look it, but you are it. The words you use carry power. They carry weight. Don't use words descriptively in the wrong way. You may not like your head, but it's nice. 
You know, I mean, I'm not that old, but I've lived a bit on this earth. And I've seen people I grew up with who, who had very bad looking heads. And now their head looks nice. Because, you know, somehow when, when you are brilliant, people don't care how your head looks like. I had classmates who had very double head. <laughs> you know, but, you know, they've done something with their lives and nobody cares about their double head again, you know. There's hope for the future. There's hope for the future. You have to describe yourself right. You have to use the right descriptive word. You have to describe your marriage right. You have to describe your children right. You have to describe your experiences right. Don't call it something, this thing is going nowhere. Use the right words and use it with the intention that the description you give it is what you are looking for. You have to learn to work like God. Call the things which be not as though they were. That is how God works and that's how we work. Let me conclude by looking at what to say when you are in a battle. We looked at how God uses words. You've looked at how God wants us to use words. We've looked at the power of words. We've looked at Abraham and why he was able to call himself the way God called him the father of many nations when it didn't look like he would have a child. When you get into a battle, what should you say? When life is fighting you, what should you say? In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 42 to 47, David teaches us that one of the things we have to do when we face giants is to be able to say the right thing. And David says, you should be able to say, I come in the name of the Lord. I come in the name of the Lord. The Bible says, and when the Philistine looked out, that is Goliath, looked about and saw David, he disdained him for he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. So the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Note what he says. Come to me. Come to me, David, and I'm going to massacre you. David responds, If you want me to come, I am coming. Verse 45. And David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear, with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. The God of the armies of Israel, whom you have divided. When people challenge you to a fight, go to the battle. But don't go in your own name. Don't go in your own strength. Don't go in your own power. You have to go in the name of the Lord. Come to me. Yes, I'm coming. But I come in the name of the Lord. It's one thing to come in your name. Another thing to come in the name of the Lord. When you come in your name, you are limited to your resources. When you come in the name of the Lord, you are exposed to God's resources. I come in the name of the Lord. Every morning when you wake up, you should be able to say, I come in the name of the Lord. Monday, here I come. There are people who are waiting and hope Monday will not come tomorrow. But I've known that Monday always comes. Monday is going to come tomorrow morning, but you have to say, I come Monday in the name of the Lord. I don't know what giant is calling you on Monday, but you are going to come in the name of the Lord. Whenever you are in a battle, you have to declare, I come in the name of the Lord. I come in the name of the Lord. The second thing you have to learn to declare whenever you are in a battle is the Lord is with me to fight for me. The Lord is with me to fight for me. I come in the name of the Lord. The Lord is with me to fight for me. Deuteronomy chapter 20 verse 1 to 4. When you go out to battle against your enemies and see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you, do not be afraid of them for the Lord your God is with you who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. 
So it shall be when you are on the verge of battle that the priest shall approach and speak to the people. And he shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you are on the verge of battle with your enemies. Do not let your heart faint. Do not be afraid. And do not tremble or be terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Somebody say, The Lord is with me to fight for me. Say, I come in the name of the Lord. The Lord is with me to fight for me. Say, I come in the name of the Lord. And the Lord is with me to fight for me. That must be your language in battle. I come in the name of the Lord. And the Lord is with me to fight for me and to save me and to deliver me. Third thing you have to learn to say when you are in battle. Joel chapter 3 verse 9 to 10. He says, proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. If you're going to learn to win your battle, you have to learn to say, I am strong. I am strong. I come in the name of the Lord. The Lord will fight for me and give me victory. And I am strong. He didn't say let the strong say I'm strong. He didn't say let the mighty say I'm strong. He said let the weak say the opposite. So when you're fighting your knees are shaking. You still say I'm strong. You say pastor I don't feel strong. Well that's why you should say I'm strong. What are you going to say when you are not strong? I'm a lizard. Let the weak say, I come in the name of the Lord. The Lord will fight for me and deliver me. And I am strong. Learn to declare your strength. Learn to declare your strength. It's the power of your words. One thing you, you would learn even psychologists will tell you the power of your own words on your emotions. As you declare it and you hear it, something rises on the inside of you. Fear is dissipated and faith be and confidence and assurance begins to rise on the inside of you. And what you considered impossible for you becomes very possible. Where you seem very unable, you seem able. Because many times what defeats you in the battle, it's your imagination, not the reality. You have to say, I am strong. The power of your words. Let the weak say, I am strong. And final thing, when you get into battle, you should be able to say, I am well able to overcome. Numbers chapter 13, verse 30. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. Somebody say, I am well able to overcome. Say, I am strong. Say, the Lord will fight for me. And say, I come in the name of the Lord. These are declarations that must come out of your mouth. Now, when I say battle, it could be any battle. Maybe it's, it's a marital battle. You have to say the right things. Maybe a health battle, challenge in your health. Your words are very important. Maybe it's a battle in a relationship with somebody at home. Maybe you, you, you're just in a battle with somebody, something. Something is fighting you. Something is coming against you. You have to be able to say, I come in the name of the Lord. The Lord will fight for me and give me the victory. I am strong and I'm well able. You say, but I don't feel strong. That's why you have to say it. If you're strong, you don't say it. But if you need strength, you say, I'm strong. Let the weak say, I'm strong. I'm well able. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm going to go into this battle. I will come with a testimony. God will give me the song of victory. 
This will turn to my promotion and my elevation. God will turn around my captivity and give me a song. I will prevail. I have the strength. I am well able to overcome. These giants are meat and bread for me. And when you look through the Bible, you'll find Moses did the same when he had to deal with Pharaoh. And throughout the Bible, every time there is a battle, people had to learn to speak the words of faith. There is power in your words. Don't describe things in the wrong way. Don't call destruction when destruction is not calling you. It is going in front of you. Call it my promotion. Call it favor. Call it opportunity. Call it an open door. But never call it your destruction. Never call it your end. Don't call anything the finality of your life. Because there is hope for your future. God will make a way for you. God will turn the situation around. God will make all things work together for your good. And you have to learn to call the things which be not as though they were. The power of our words are rooted in our strength in the Lord. It's not just about saying positive things. It's about having the power of God living on the inside of you. No matter how much you want to say positive things, if there's emptiness inside of you, it's not going to work. For this to become a reality, you must have the power of God living on the inside of you. And the power of God comes inside of you through Jesus Christ. He's the power of God. And when he comes into your life, he saves you. He forgives you of your sins. He makes you a brand new person. When his spirit is in your life, your words become very powerful. If you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, I love your word. I love it. Now I know that there is hope for me. That's good. But the source of that power is Jesus Christ. If you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to give you the chance for you to be born again, for you to give your life to Jesus, for your sins to be forgiven, for you to be assured that there is a place for you in heaven. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you are here this morning, you say, Pastor, I want the way to heaven. I want to make it to heaven. I want to be born again. I want my, my life to be turned around. I want to overcome in the battles of life. I have just one thing for you. Let Jesus come into your life and be your Lord and Savior. If you're here this morning listening to me and you want Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you want to be born again, you want to make it to heaven, with every head bowed, every eye closed, just lift up your right hand wherever you are. You want to give your life to Jesus? You want to be assured of heaven? Lift up your hand. Don't feel shy. Don't feel embarrassed. There are many of you who need to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Let your hand go up. Let your hand go up. Were they in the balconies, in the overflow rooms? Lift your hand up. Lift your hand up. If you have your hand up wherever you are, I'm going to ask you to rise up wherever you are. Just rise up. Rise up. 